Content warning, mentions and discussions of sexualization of children, pedophilia, and child pornography. If any of these topics are upsetting to you, you may just want to sit this one out. I wanted to like Kobayashi's Dragon Maid. It's a wholesome romance between a monster and human, and an openly queer romance at that, which ends up exploring the nature of found families, which, as I discussed in my last video, is one of my favorite types of story in media. For context, I have seen the first season of Kobayashi's Dragon Maid a couple of years ago. This was back when I still naively listened to AnnieTuber recommendations, and I wanted to see a cute, lighthearted gay romance between a dragon maid and her tired, cynical crush. I was delighted when Toru made a point to state that her attraction to Kobayashi is romantic and sexual, completely destroying any possibility of queerbaiting. But the more I watched, and the more the story strayed from Toru and Kobayashi, the increasingly less delighted I became. Until finally episode 6 happened and one of the children pins down another child, and I had to ask myself, how did I get here? Dragon Maid recently came under fire when the new season was announced and this character dropped and everybody lost their minds. There were a ton of different gut reactions, from her design is terrible to Ilulu did nothing wrong and I stand Ilulu, and her character is great to her design is pedophilic, there were people trying to redesign her and fix her. With everyone on Twitter being vocally opinionated about what is a very sensitive issue, it made me realize that maybe they didn't know what they were talking about or what coding even means and how it applies to character design. For context, I am an artist. Hey, hi, hello, I'm Neuralities. Welcome to my TED Talk. I really hope this isn't your first video you're seeing of mine because I usually try to stay in my lane and avoid meaningless discourse. But I went to a fine art school where I learned and studied anatomy and I have a degree in illustration. So when it comes to art and character design, believe me when I say I know what I'm talking about. I may end up over explaining myself, but I'm just going to try to break this down as thoroughly as I can from an art perspective. So really, this is less of a hot take and more of an explanation behind what is a long running problem. What is coding? Coding is a term used in media to refer to when an author wants to convey an aspect of a character to the audience, but does not want to or maybe isn't allowed to explicitly state what that aspect is. And sometimes the character may not even literally be the thing that they are being coded as. For instance, Renaissance-era Disney villains were often designed and behaved in a way that read to the audience as queer-coded. Scar is a feminine and willowy, Jafar wears eyeliner, Ursula was literally based off of a drag queen. At the time, the character designers were using this coding to illustrate that there was something inherently deviant about these characters because of the way they contrasted to the designs of the cis, het, young, and beautiful ideal of the protagonists. But this decision sort of backfired and ended up making queer audiences really sympathetic and into the villains who are overall fun and a bit campy as opposed to the hyper-masculine and feminine leads. And this is the thing that you have to understand about coding. All coding is not inherently bad. It really depends on why the author is choosing to code a character and what that coding is meant to convey. When a corporation like Disney consistently codes characters as a marginalized group, like people of color or the LGBT community, in order to specifically convey to the audience that they are evil, that is obviously not a good thing. Which is why context and framing is so important. What is child coding? Like queer coding, child coding isn't inherently problematic, it just depends on how it's used. Like, Baby Yoda is child coded. This robot is child coded. Koroks and Kodama are also child coded. Child coding just means that a character has design elements that make them read to the audience as childlike even when they may not be children in a technical sense. Some of these design elements include being small, having big eyes, being naive, or possibly nonverbal. And when it comes to discussing child coding and how people throw the term around, we end up running into some problems with exactly what it does and does not apply to because short women also exist. 
Take, for instance, La Brava, a small-time villain from My Hero Academia who is a short adult woman. Her design has elements that can potentially read as child-coded. She's short, her head is big, and her eyes are placed lower down on her face. And I think the creators may have been aware of that possibility and made a few deliberate design choices to mitigate that reading. Like, La Brava is short, but she's curvy. And not just her chest, her waist-to-hips ratio is that of an adult. She fits in with Hero Academia's style of cartoony, exaggerated silhouettes. Her voice actor is an adult who uses her normal speaking voice. Ugh, this is so frustrating! Whatever do you mean, dear girl? The JSTOR video should be racking up views, but it's barely being watched! People on the internet have no taste! Her Japanese voice actor is a bit higher pitched, but only in the way that Japanese women tend to speak in a higher register, and not because she's deliberately trying to sound younger. La Brava is romantically involved with Gentle, but again, in the text they are both explicitly consenting adults, and if you think that short and tall people can't be together, you may want to take a moment to check yourself. But even if you read La Brava as child-coded, it's not really an issue because her character isn't sexualized. This is what I mean when I say that child-coding isn't inherently a problem, but it becomes one when the characters are not explicitly adults and are also being sexualized. Which brings me back to the impetus for this video and how this all applies to Dragon Maid. So, in the case of Dragon Maid, like, putting Ilulu aside, like, we're not even going to get to her yet, we have to address that Kana is designed to be a child and is also sexualized. Now, right out of the gate, some people will try to argue that she's not technically a child because she's a dragon, and they age differently, and she's really, like, a thousand. But even by dragon standards, she is still a child. Toru and Kobayashi act as her adopted paternal figures. She goes to elementary school and is in the third grade. On her trivia page, it states that her human appearance mimics that of an eight or nine year old. She is referred to as a child in the text multiple times, and she is also wearing thigh highs. I don't even know how to begin how to explain this, but. Thigh highs are a sexually charged piece of clothing in a way that stockings or knee socks just are not. Apparently, there is even a Japanese term that refers to the gap between the skirt and thigh highs that was popularized due to anime and moe subculture. If she were just wearing socks or even stockings, this wouldn't be a problem if the framing didn't also sexualize her. I'm going to very quickly show some of the clips of how the framing sexualizes Kana, and here's the timestamp to skip it if you just can't deal with that today. Okay? Okay. Kana is not even child-coded. She, in the text, is literally a child. But is Ililu child-coded? Another misunderstanding, or in air quotes, counter-argument that seemed to crop up a lot around this discussion is, 
what childlike facial proportions mean and how that applies to anime where most characters are already stylized to have larger eyes and heads. A simple way to design a character to appear as older or younger is to measure how many heads tall they are. Note that most people are not going to be 8 heads tall, like this guy here is a quarter inch short of 7 feet tall. How many heads tall you are is going to vary from person to person depending on your height. For instance, I'm 5'4", and if I measure the length of my head, I'm roughly only 6.3 heads high, which proportionally ends up putting me in the 10-year-old boy category, which is frankly not very surprising. If we proportionally scale up the child to match the adult's height, you can see that the head of the child is twice the size of the adult proportionally. And if we resize their heads to be the same size, we can see that the child's facial features are much lower down than the adult's. So when I see people argue that Dragon Maid is just in the classic anime moe style and everyone is cheapified and cute and that there's no difference between Kana and Toru, I can agree that it is hard to see the difference because it is stylized. But there is a difference if you are actually willing to look at and take the time to compare them. Measuring them by how many heads tall they are, we can see that Toru is just under six heads, which seems about right for the average Japanese woman. Meanwhile, Kana is only four and a half heads tall, which gives her the proportions of a two-year-old. I don't know what you were expecting at this point, frankly. Let's compare her facial proportions. If I select this image of Kana and overlay her on top of Toru, and when I resize her head to account for the perspective and have the chin line up in the same place, you can see that Kana's eyes are significantly lower down. Her face shape is round and less defined, which is a feature that signifies that she is a child because she was designed to look like a child. And if we do the same for Ilulu, we can see that she's proportionally the same as Kana. And if we overlay her on top of Toru, we can see that her face shape is a little bit more defined than Kana. Which would make sense considering that she's supposed to be a bit older than her. But her eyes are just as low down. And the thing is, they even unbabyified her a bit from the manga. And listen, I tried this with La Brava, and yeah, she's not even four heads tall. But again, La Brava is in the text inarguably an adult character with an adult's voice and mannerisms, while Kana and Ilulu are not, and they talk like children. <laughs> <laughs> and again, Ilulu is supposed to be visually 16 anyway, so I don't know what the argument is here, y'all. She is still depicted as a minor. Like, everybody understands how dog years work. I don't understand how we keep coming back to the 10,000-year-old dragon well. It does not matter that Baby Yoda is 50 years old, because for his species, he is a baby. Their lifespan is different. Did Ilulu start the problem? No, I think she just brought light to a problem that was already apparent in Kobayashi's Dragon Maid. From the beginning, Dragon Maid has always had unrealistic female body proportions, but up until now, it has only ever been depicted on characters that weren't minors. So I think this was the nail in the coffin for a lot of people. Here someone even tried to fix Ilulu by flattening her chest, but like this does not even fix the problem because it is these other design elements that code her as a child and she is still in thigh highs and her underwear. Coding can be used for many reasons, but historically it has been used when you want to depict something that may be socially frowned upon or even illegal, and you would get in trouble if it were explicitly in the text. And I do have to wonder if the dragon angle and giving Ilulu such a large chest was one of the ways the author tried to sidestep the child coding accusations. It is the pattern of all these things in Dragon Maid that is upsetting. Even if it doesn't happen that often, it's the pattern of 
Rika's eyes rolling back when she touches Kana, Shota being consistently flustered by Lukoa, the sunscreen section, the compromising framing of Kana, and now Ilulu's design, it all starts adding up. Closing thoughts. Do I think everybody who watches Dragon Maid is automatically a child predator? Uh, no, I don't, and neither should you. That kind of single-minded ideology is inherently flawed. Vast blanket statements like that are just not true. And the thing is, like, I get it. I get why some people want to defend Dragon Maid like parts of it are legitimately good. When the focus is only on Kobayashi and Toru and their found family dynamic with Kana, there's a lot I genuinely like. And I was willing to put up with some stuff that made me uncomfortable because there still aren't a lot of canonically queer romances, and definitely not ones with this level of sakuga. People can watch media that is problematic critically, and just because they watched it or liked some aspects of it does not inherently make them problematic in the same way because that is not how humans work and no media is perfect. But at the same time, you can't turn around and say that the people who are upset about the design of a child being sexualized are being too sensitive because they just don't get anime. As an audience and as creators, we have to ask ourselves what message is a piece of work sending out into the world? And how are people going to respond to it? And if your story invites people predators in and makes a space where they might feel validated, maybe you should assess yourself and consider making some changes. So with that being said, I don't think I'm going to partake in season two of Kobayashi's Dragon Maid. And also to everyone watching this who managed to get this far, this is not an excuse to go out and dox people on Twitter over their opinion on an anime. Like, please do not dox anyone, not just because doxing is horrible in and of itself, but when you try and attack people who engage in fictional media that depicts sensitive topics like abuse or pedophilia, you are minimizing the problem of actual real-world abuse and pedophilia. Which is why I'm not even really that upset about Ilulu, but it's easier to explain some of these problems in the context around her design and not the things that I can't even address because they are infinitely more upsetting. Like, there are still people out there making lengthy video essays about Roroni Kenshin and how it's a masterpiece when in 2017 the author was charged for the possession of child pornography and confessed to being attracted to 10 to 15 year old girls. And he wasn't fired and he was allowed to keep publishing his manga because it makes money. Like, you can't ignore that. And I can't make a video explaining why that is a bad thing because it is so obviously a bad thing that no one in their right mind would try to defend it. And if you continue to monetarily support his work while knowing what he's done, you are supporting his actions in at least a small way.